Welcome to Gold Silver Pros. Now, I mean, I have so many questions about that, but I guess uh, on the face of it, you mentioned the term recession, and um, isn't it funny that that the the media and the sort of public facing narrative is that we're still toying with one. It's not quite a recession yet. It's this, that, the other thing. Like they're so reluctant to say it, <laughs> right? Whereas the rest of us that are on the inside of this are going, this has been a recession for a long time. I think it's, it's been a non-technical recession. I'll, I'll, make the differ- I'll make the differentiation between nominal and real. Nominal is what you have when you don't discount anything for inflation and you look at things just top line numbers. And one of the things I prove in my book is you can't do that because the government has screwed with the numbers so much. I'm just speaking U.S. here. I'm, I'm sure it's probably true everywhere else, but let's just talk about the U.S. So the government has screwed with the numbers so much you can't depend on them. And when you look, when you try to compare 1980s unemployment to employment today, you realize it's different. And anyway, the government screws around with the numbers. And so I think we've been in a recession for a long time. I think it's very clear. Um, and I think the average person knows that. I mean, I have people come into my store and they're selling me their gold chains and necklaces. I had, I had this young lady come in, she's 18 years old, and she's like, I'm trying to go to nursing school, my parents can't afford it, I can't afford it, I'm selling my necklace. She bought, brought me a necklace which had about $50 in gold in it, I gave her 200 bucks. And I didn't tell her I was giving her 200 bucks because I wanted her to have the money, I just gave her the money. Because I felt so bad that here is this 18 year old blessed child that's trying to go to nursing school and be a, a good part of the community. And this is all she's got. And that's all she's got. And I didn't, I can't pay for a college, but I can help her out. You know, it's the plight of people right now. When you're on the ground like this and you see people selling off their prized jewelry that their husband gave them, when you see people selling off the uh, plate, where the silverware sets and the extravagant things they've had in their family for 200 years, which are family heirlooms, when you see that, you know it's not good on the ground. But you don't get that acknowledgement for government. So there's a separation between what the government says and what I see every day. And so to me, I think we've been in a recession. Uh, The government doesn't want to call it. Obviously, it's not politically expedient to do it, especially with a presidential election this year. They're probably not going to want to do it. But, I mean, that's the truth. We're in a recession. So those, (coughs) excuse me, those who lived through um, the great financial crisis, the dot-com crash, they -hmm. experienced massive drawdowns in their portfolio so they can appreciate what you just said. So, Rob, if the stock market does crash, does, um, you know, mean revert as you're talking about, What do you see happening with pension funds and how do you see the Fed reacting here? Well, pensions are basically bankrupt. Uh, All the good assets have been taken out of the pensions. There's a lot of paper bubble assets in them. Those kind of assets tend to have the biggest crash when we do have a crash. So whenever the next crash comes, uh, the pensions, you know, for all intents and purposes are broke because not only do will the asset valuations uh, come down quite a bit, but in addition, Uh, The amount of money now paying into those pensions is not as much as is coming out. It's the demographic problem that you have with the baby boomers, a large generation, the last generation really to have pensions or at least widespread pensions. Uh, You know, a few people still have them, but it's minor. Uh, Most people have more like a defined contribution plans um, instead of defined benefit plans. But the pension being a defined benefit plan, you got to pay out those benefits unless people are paying in. And at the same time, the market is retreating. So I don't think that there's a lot of value left in the pensions personally. Um, you know, I had a very small pension with EY a few years ago when I was in consulting and I cashed out as soon as I left the company because I was like, there's no way that they're going to pay this out. And it wasn't big enough for me to live on anyway. It was just a block of money. So I took the penalty, you know, filled out my tax forms and, and took the pension for people that are, you know, that have longer term pensions or 401ks, you know, I'm, I'm not your financial advisor. I can't tell you what to do, but you may want to start looking at risk scenarios and, and try to determine, okay, does it make sense for me to leave money in these assets? If these are risk assets and they're going to come down, and we also know the demographic problem supporting a lot of these markets is going to start to flip, you know, uh, the biggest wealth transfer is coming. And that wealth transfer is going to come from the older generations to the new. And depending upon how these older generations are positioned, though, that wealth transfer, a lot of that could be evaporated. Uh, I think Kiplinger, Kiplinger had a study a couple of years ago that says it's going to be 64 trillion. But it won't be 64 trillion if the stock market crashes. It could be right. 30 trillion or 15 trillion. So um, if you're certainly waiting on that wealth to come down to you, uh, it depends on what that wealth is parked in. Uh, so we'll, we're going to have to see. It's going to be interesting times the next few years to see what happens. Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I made an observation, I guess, a few years ago. Um, so sort of post post 2008 and all that. 
Um, remember when the Big Short came out? The book, both the book and the movie. I guess I only watched the movie. I'm like one of those. You know? Did you Did you read the book? No, I definitely just watched the movie. Um, but um, it, it was good for me because I'm not a financial person. Like I I I, I learned my my financial dictionary on the job, um, you know, at Pine Tree Capital, evaluating deals and all of this capital markets, this big money uh, stuff sort of uh, was learned on the job. And it was later in life, you know, so I, I can't claim to be an expert there. But I did make a few very practical observations, I thought at the time, which one of them was, um, you know, I, I remember this when Barack Obama sort of took over and the Fed with Yellen, et cetera, they were you know, clamoring about, we're, we just had gone through a lot of QE, right? All the quantitative easing and then gold had gone insane. And then they were talking about, um, you know, how the economy was strengthening and how jobs were coming back. And the first thing, and to your point with the jobs, is I was looking and it was like part-time jobs. Um, there was a lot of like part-time jobs, but they were just calling them jobs. They're like, oh yeah, there's more jobs. It's like, are they more McDonald's jobs or are they factory jobs? And then if I go back to my hometown, there used to be like seven factories, eight factories when I was a kid. There's one now, you know, like everything has been gutted. And so I know there's not really good jobs. And then if you go back to like picking up my nieces and nephews at the school, and a lot of these people that are there are, are young people that I went to school with, you know, and grew up with, and I can see them come in and they're, they're looking run down, their teeth are brown and, you know, they're having a hard time. I, you know, drugs is an alcohol. That's a lot going on. And it's just sad to see, but that's a real observation. I mean, it's one town, but then if I, you know, I had the benefit of moving around quite a bit, you know, in my field and, and seeing a lot of towns and, uh, and so, yeah, things weren't better and we we're being told that they were, we we're being told everything was putting itself back, you know, we're putting ourselves back together, but we're not. And then when I learned about all this subprime stuff, like, I think the movie does a pretty good job explaining it. And, uh, you know, learning about all of that and all of a sudden seeing all the automakers who we bail out, there's suddenly 0% down, 0% for X number of years, three years, come and get your brand new, da-da-da, Hyundai, Elantra, whatever it is, right? And every single dealership, it's it's bombarding us on the radio, 0% down, 0% whatever. And everybody, I looked around, I didn't see any K cars, I didn't see any pieces of shit. I saw everybody's driving a new car and how are they paying for this stuff? So I just I, I the house of cards thing it's transformed it, it it's it doesn't seem to have gotten better it just seems like everybody got the blinders put on them and I can you trick a market into believing everything's okay and then things work and then for how long does that last Well that's what they're that's what they're trying to do but if you look through history one of the things that I try to do is not just look at what's here or the next last 10 or 20 years I look way back so, I mean, you have contrative and contrative cycle theory, which is 80 year. I think Neil Howe may have popularized that with, with uh, his book on, um, you know, the four seasons. But originally that was contrative back in like 1919. Uh, it was commissioned by like the rural Russian family to study economic cycles. And he came out and said, there's an 80 year cycle. And it's four ge people generations. And you have a, a winter, a spring, a summer, and a fall. And... If you take three of those and put them together, you have the nation state cycle because the average nation state, dominant nation state, like the US or Great Britain in its heyday or Spain or Rome or uh, any of those, lasts about 240, 260 years. Rome was broken in two because you had the Republic and then the emperor. So that's really two epics. And there was also two versions, the East and the West. But each one lasts about 250 years. This is done by Sir John Glubb. Sir John Glubb, um, much like you moving around, what, he was in charge of like Middle Eastern armies. He was in charge of the you know parts of the British army. He was an officer for much of his life. And then he traveled around doing speaking engagements. And he's like, I'm noticing the same things over here that I'm noticing in my own country. And it kind of shocked him. He's like, wait a minute. We're different culture. We're different areas, different money. How is this? All? And then he studied it all the way back to the ancient Assyrians. So he covered almost 2,800 years of history in his study. And he figured out there are mileposts for every nation state, and they're almost the same, and they occur at almost the same time. And it doesn't matter if it's 3,000 years ago or if it's 2024. It's the same, and so it's the pattern analysis. And so I do a lot of pattern analysis, and I have a gentleman that's coming on our 
uh, YouTube channel on Thursday that does Elliott wave analysis, and he said it's based on fractals of math. And my own study of fractals of math have led me to believe that humans are very pattern-based and that using math you can kind of model it. Anyway, long story short, I studied long term, and what you figure out is we played this game before. You know, we played this game in Britain, and we played this game in Spain, and we played it in Rome, and we played it in Assyria, and we played it everywhere. And it's basically um, when you get to the end, this credit boom, you know, the fake money, which is where we are, um, the government and other interested parties will do whatever they can to make everybody seem like it's normal. And you have this euphoria. And we have officially entered the euphoria stage. I mean, when you have GameStop driven up to whatever, now there's a, a famous movie on Netflix about it. You have GameStop driven up even though the company's basically broke. These are signs that you're in the euphoria stage. People don't want to believe that the punch bowl will be taken away. They don't want to believe we'll ever get into a recession. And see, 2008 to 2009, what that taught me was there's no rationality in the system because we didn't fix it. We kicked the can down the road. Totally. That was my, uh, that was my observation too, is that in 2008, 2009, it was like a complete just kick it down. Kick it down the road. The amount of debt we've created basically has cemented the fact that we can't get out of it in the United States. Uh, Kenneth Rogoff and Carmen Reinhart wrote about this. A famous one was from Harvard, I think one from Yale, and they wrote this book back in 2009 where they analyzed this. And once you get past 90% of debt to GDP, you, you, you can't recover. A crash has got to happen. We got up to like 140. I think now we're down like 120 or something. But you know, the United States has passed point of no return. Um, so we're, we're in trouble and we're going to basically have, well, you, you either have a default or you have to print your way out and everybody's always chosen to print their way out. Nobody wants to ever default. They do. It's a soft default, but then they try to print their way out. Now, I think that's where we're going and I don't think we're that far from it, but I think the euphoria that we've had the last 12 to 15 years has been based on a bunch of money printing, but now it takes something like $2 to, of money printing to get a dollar of GDP. So now you're like the snake eating its tail because you're spending money but getting less back. It's like opening, a, it's like running a business and you're spending $100 a day but you're only getting $50 back. You're gonna go out of business, right? So that, the US economy is gonna go out of business here before too long. And it's just a matter of time and it's just, we're sitting in this cycle where nobody wants to admit it, it's euphoria. And what will happen is the young generation, Gen Z, are gonna be the ones, they're gonna be the quote unquote hero generation. They're gonna be the most maligned generation along with the millennials. They're stupid, they don't know anything, they're the problem. But when the crash happens, they're, they're going to be the ones that dig us out of it. That's what history teaches us. And I think that they'll end up being, you know, they'll end up being building the new modern economy. And I think those generations will have a lot to do with it. Um, but that's what we're going through. We're going through a change of cultural, political, economic systems. But in the United States, it's the end of our dominant nation state. People are getting out of the dollar. They're de-dollarizing. Uh, our culture, nobody respects us anymore, really. I mean, um, Look at our, our, our political leaders. Um, right now, we're talking about impeaching our president because it doesn't seem to have cognitive function. You know, this is in the news. I'm not, you know, I'm not one side taking sides, but this is in the news. You know, all this kind of stuff is happening. We have a quote unquote border invasion. I live in Texas and we've called special sessions in Texas to deal. Yet we only have legislative sessions in Texas every two years. So this year in 2024, we're not supposed to have it. They've got a special legislation going on trying to deal with the border crisis. And it, the border crisis is so many people are coming in, by the way, which is also a hallmark of a nation state that's on its last legs, according to John Glove, because if you look at Assyria, if you look at Rome, if you look at Spain, if you look at Britain, if you look at every single one of those nation states, the exact same thing happened. You had the economic default, you had a rush of people in because they see the euphoria, so they're gonna go to America for the, you know, the golden dream. It looks good. Yeah, exactly. That's what we're seeing it in Canada too. Yeah. Yeah. You're seeing it everywhere. Mass migration. Yeah. And what's happened is we've exported all of our inflation and all these smaller economies have been destroyed. Look at Argentina, look at Zimbabwe, look at Turkey with all their currency problems. And now all those people are coming here thinking, oh, we better go over here. They're doing better. But all they're doing is going to the land of the most risk. Why? Because we're the world reserve currency. When it busts here, it's going to bust bigger than anywhere else. That's also what history teaches us. So that's where we sort of are. So actually, the immigration problems are going to solve themselves because when the dollar busts, everybody's going to leave. You're going to hear a great sucking sound outside the United States. Yeah. People are like, I'm going back to Chile. <laughs> to somewhere else where they're actually doing okay. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the insidiousness of the system. What causes currencies to blow up and economic systems to blow up? Too much spending. 
Well, if they can play around with buttons on this currency and just simply reissue it every time, um, they can never have that. Why do they want that? Well, if you look at the Chinese, whenever Chinese currencies are blown up, the peasants are revolted. Whenever the French currencies blown up, the peasants revolted. So all these countries don't want the rank and file protesting and banging on doors and saying, you know, look at the farmer protests going on in France and Spain right now, you know, uh, that stopped, by the way, stopped the EU commission from instituting a 90% ban on CO2, a 50% a 50 reduction in agriculture production. I mean, how many people would starve if that happened? The farmers took, sprayed crap all over government buildings and did it long enough, had enough protests that it stopped them from enacting this legislation. They don't want that. And once they get control of the currency, those protests won't work anymore. Because if you show up at a protest and they identify you, they just deleted your bank account. Okay, well, Rob, here's a question that Ronald Harris has. He says, what does this mean for those of us who own and possess gold coins and financial or, well, fiscal gold? Uh, will they try and take it from us? It's entirely possible, although in the U.S., whenever they did the, the executive order, I think in 1933-ish, I think it was F, maybe FDR at the time issued the executive order, and then they revalued gold, and then, you know, they basically stole the gold from the people and revalued it and paid off their debt, essentially basically. And that gold went into uh, what became the Exchange Stabilization Fund, which is where they intervene on markets today. So the the inter, the plunge protection team, the common name, where they intervene in every single market, uh, they did that by, by originally funded by the stolen gold in 1933, the gold confiscation. We don't have, most people don't have gold anymore. So would they confiscate it? I don't know if they have to. Uh, I think the statistic is only about one half of 1% of all financial investment in America goes into gold or silver, something like that. So there's not enough of it running around. It's not in our money anymore. 64, they got rid of silver from the coinage. Was it 33 that they did confiscation, got rid of most of the gold. Then they made it illegal to own gold. So yeah, we have it in jewelry form. It's watered down 10 or 14 karat cheapo stuff, right? No offense to people that have 10 or 14 karat jewelry, but you know, it, it's not pure gold. It's not 22 or 24 K like our coinage. So is there enough, I mean, is there enough gold rolling around to where it would be a threat to the system for certain people? If you're smart and you're a farmer and you've got some gold and silver, you can be able to barter with it to get what you need, fertilizer, whatever, probably. Are the vast majority of people that have been brainwashed by our education system living in the cities going to have gold and silver? No, not unless they're going to all of our coin shops and buying it. There are stackers out there. But there aren't enough of us. So I don't know if they have to outright confiscate it. I think that they're probably going to try to tax it. Because uh, that's usually the way they try to control things. They, they throw a tax on it. And they say, well, you got to report this. And if you don't, you know, the IRS is going to come after you. And, you know, you're going to have fines and penalties and we're going to bankrupt you type of thing. I think they'll probably go that way. Um, what they're going to do with the mines, I don't know. And, and Brandon, you may have mentioned this before about the mine shutdowns. Part of the reason for the mine shutdowns is not only newly elected leftists in Mexico that want to terrorize mining companies, it's also to control the flow of the metal. If, if Mexico is the second largest silver producer in the world, which they are, and you want to reduce silver, what do you do? You terrorize the mining industry and have them shut down. You either raise their costs, you put burdensome regulation on them, or you say, oh, you, we're not going to approve new mines for the next 10 years. Uh, how else do you control the mine supply? It's how they do it. So there are ways to squeeze the supply chain to make it hard for the everyday person to get a bunch of silver. Silver is in scarcity right now. We've used a billion more ounces in the last four years than we produced. Well, that's not a coincidence. If the derivative markets would let silver price run, we'd probably be sitting at least 40, 50 bucks right now and all the primary silver miners would be running and pumping it out. Um, if if the United States wanted Mexico to produce a bunch of silver, they'd probably throw a lot of dollars their way and, and, you know, go buy it straight from their silver mines. But all they have to do is make a phone call and say, hey, uh, Mexico, can you put some restraints on your silver production? Um, you know, I, that's kind of a conspiracy theory, but I think that's a lot of the conversations that go on in the background. What they want to do, uh, the commissioner of the CFTC came out in a public interview. It's on YouTube at the Boca V conference a couple of years ago, and a lot of us have covered it and said during Silver Squiz three years ago, 
uh, Janu last day of January three years ago and first two days of February. So it's been about almost exactly three years to date. Um, Rost and Benham, the, the silver price was right at 30 bucks. And he, he admitted that as the, the chairman of the regulator, not the markets, the regulator, that they stopped the price of silver at 30 bucks and would not let it rise. And he said how they did it. There were four or five methods they used, and they stopped it cold. They don't want the price of silver to rise. One, they need to keep it cheap for industry, but two, they don't want people getting inter interested. It would screw up their CBDC plans. Silver is the poor man's gold. It's the money of the peasants, right? So you want to limit it and control it, and they've got limits and controls. Now, well, the big thing is what's going to happen when the dollar blows up? Will there be enough awareness for people to revolt? and use gold and silver anyway, I'm hoping. Um, I'm part of a legislative committee of Citizens for Sound Money. We wrote, I was part of writing that legislation for the state of Florida. State of Florida has two bills in the House and two in the Senate. It got through committee. They're not gonna approve it this session, but next session, it's actually in the top 10 list of things to get approved in Florida. We spoke to the governor's office and one of their cabinet committee said, we're in favor if you can get it through the, you know, the, the legislatures. So we think we can get it approved. If a state the size of Florida approves gold as money again, um, we're, then we're going to come over to Texas, my home state, and do it there. So we're trying to do things to protect the people. Um, will we be able to do that in time? I don't know. But we're sure as hell trying because it's scary. The, the world that they want to lead us into is a bit scary. And I don't, I don't know. I, want my, I got two kids. I don't want my two kids living in that world. So you recently wrote that liquidity problems coming soon in the debt markets as the repo market dips below 500 billion, that yeah. banks will have to tighten lending standards as a result. So expect a market lockup sometime this year, forcing the Fed to intervene, sending bond rates much higher. Will you speak into that a little bit more for us? Yeah. So the repo market came to light during the financial cri great financial crisis. Uh, when uh, analysts went back to the great financial crisis years later and examined it, they noticed that the repo market locked up first and then that was an indicator that the rest of the debt markets were locking up and without getting too much into detail repurchase market is basically an overnight funding market where high quality very short-term assets are put up and you can lend those out and earn interest on them from people that that want the debt and um, you get the cash back so if you've got that kind of debt and you're needing cash to overnight finance your business and you don't want to go to the fed window or you don't have other lines of liquidity as a short-term loan a lot of people go to the repurchase market or the repo market so that market in a debt-based system uh, is the marginal uh, liquidity uh, market for the system. And by that, I mean that is it exists at the margins to finance the economy above and beyond, you know, the rest of the currency circulating in the system. It's a very quick overnight market, and it's something that people have become to rely on for income. The problem is that that liquidity is drying up. At one point, we had one point, uh, five or six trillion. I forget the number. Now we're down to five or a billion. And that's a warning sign. Once it went under a trillion, uh, economic analysts started talking about going, this could be an issue. Because that is also, if you think about uh, mathematics, that's an exponential market too. It needs to be bigger than before because they have more debt. We have more money sloshing around. So the numbers in repo have to be bigger than last time. And they're already reaching thresholds that we would, under normal circumstances, consider a problem. Uh, in, in a nutshell, if the liquidity doesn't come back to the market, and I don't see it doing that because of interest rates. Interest rates got too high. People did not want to borrow in that market because once you get over 5%, they don't want to pay 5%. They'll find other means of transacting. Uh, but the problem is there's not a lot of short-term liquidity outside that market. It's drying up. And so once that repo market freezes, it causes problems in the overnight or the intraday funding markets, and it can cause the system to lock up. Now, the Fed has been intervening in that market, but they've been intervening less lately. And if they're going to end up being the, the liquidity provider of last resort, but if they allow that repo market to get drawn down and there's not enough liquidity in the system, it locks up and we have another Lehman event. This time, however, more banks, I believe, are in trouble. If you look at the FDIC's website and how many banks are in trouble already, when this repo market dries up, we're going to have more bank failures than we did in 2008 or uh, last spring. And it's definitely So that's be, what you're seeing coming. That's what I'm seeing coming, and it could happen this year or next year. But I, you know, I think the Fed and FDIC will intervene again. But I don't see how they stop it this time. I mean, it to me, that's a runaway freight train. Interesting. So, Rob, what's your take on the exploding deficits and large debts of the U.S. and how it pertains to the currency, the U.S. dollar, and how the rest of the world seems to be de-dollarizing, as you said, 
In other words, what do you see for the U.S. dollar over the next one to five years? What do you see for purchasing power? And what do you see for the impacts on the markets and where investors will be putting their money for both appreciation and for protection? Yeah, so essentially um, the, the debt market is the dollar market, and we're at the end of that market where we have a lot of debts. So we have a lot of dollars slushing around, slushing around. Uh, but that's caused excess inflation all over the world. And what's happening is it, other central banks and other countries realize that risk, so they're designing a new system. It's a central bank digital currency system. It's going to have some gold backing. You know, I gave a lecture at PDAC about um, uh, last week, last weekend, about how uh, this is likely to occur. Uh, I drew a lot of information from the BIS's website, IMF's website, friends I have, you know, in the space. Um, but essentially, the new system is coming, and they know the old system is coming back. It's coming. It's coming apart. And right now, uh, the dollar index is under a little bit of pressure because the world's de-dollarizing. There was a study by the World Gold Council in 2023, and they they interviewed the world's central banks and said, you know, what are dollar reserves going to look like held around the world? Meaning, is the dollar still going to be the unit of trade for the world? And they said, well, it's a, it was at 59% at the time that survey was taken last June. Now it's at 58. All-time lows, by the way. We're already at all-time lows of the dollar being held by other central banks for trade. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway... They said, no, it's going to come down to 40 to 50. Well, once it comes under 50, technically, you're not the reserve currency anymore because other currencies are now being held more. Uh, you may have a plurality, but you're not the, the dominant currency. So we're already in the beginning of the end of the dollar phase. And so as that dollar system comes down, the interesting thing is going to be, be to see what replaces it. Gold will do very well. A lot of dollar-based investments or investments that depend on a strong dollar will not do well. Uh, things that uh, hold value when currencies get in trouble will do well. Precious metals, uh, certain businesses, um, uh, income producing land or farmland, those types of things are, are the things that I would see. So what does your analysis say uh, will be the economic and banking impact of the higher for longer interest rates and the current debt levels? And what do you see happening if the Federal Reserve accelerates its bond sales to cool the economy? Yeah, the Fed is stuck in a tough position. If you look at what happened last year, we had the three big bank failures, SVB, First Republic, uh, Silver, it was it Silvergate, Silver whatever Gate. the banks, yeah, yeah, whatever the banks were. And those were the second, third, and fourth largest failures after the one that occurred during the, the Great Recession. So uh, those definitely were like warning shots across the bow. The, 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 uh, the Fed and the government put out the uh, bank term funding program, which, you know, allowed the banks to put up collateral and, and get liquidity, get cash, and they could put whatever collateral they wanted. So in other words, it was a non-mark to market type of deal. It wasn't like you're going to the market with your debt and saying, let's refinance this. They went to the government and the government said, I, we don't care what the debt looks like. We'll give you money. Well, that expires on March 11th, which by the way is today. And so uh, from today, at the day that we're recording this, <laughs> there's about a year for these banks to pay it back, but they can draw no more. And I think that's one of the reasons why gold's hitting an all-time high uh, last week and now today at 2175, 2178 is because the gold market understands and certainly the bond market understands that the sort of punch bowl that we had last year to assuage the, the issues that we had in the banking system has been taken away. If you look at recently, uh, is it New York Community Bank, which is mm -hmm. tanking, and it's certainly not the biggest but it's indicative of, I think, another wave of bank failures that are coming. And we're going to continue to have bank failures while um, uh, U.S. bonds are devalued, and they're devalued by higher interest rates. When the interest rates go up, it devalues the face value of the bonds. Well, a lot of banks are holding on to a lot of these bonds. A lot of pension funds, a lot of other you know, investments are holding on, holding on to these. And when their valuations go down, it causes balance sheet problems, and it causes problems in our current system since it's a debt-based system. Not everybody's running around with cash all the time or hard right. assets, some sort of hard thing that they can sell. A lot of times it's, you know, balance sheet risk. And the balance sheet risk is when interest rates go up, it devalues your uh, debt asset holdings. And it, and it and that's the dark side of the debt system is when interest rate goes up, debt becomes debt again. It's not money. Right. Because when interest rates go up, you can't trade your old debt for new. See, in the, in the old system, if you had good servicing debt, you could put that up as collateral for money. You could do it through the repo market. The bank term funding program is something that we did last year. But you could do it in the open market or you could refinance. Well, now you can't do that. With rising interest rates, that old debt's not as valuable as new debt, which is going to get that higher coupon. So it's causing problems. So I think that we're going to have a raft of bank failures coming up. Um, I think uh, it's going to make it hard for the Fed in that environment. They're going to want to cut. The problem is we have that we just talked about, that inflation monster looming. Yeah. And if you cut, you're going to increase pressure on inflation because you're going to add more money to the economy. And we've already added an historic amount since the pandemic in 2020. 
So I think whatever the Fed does could make the problem actually worse than if they just stood by and did nothing. But that's heresy to the market because the market worships at the altar of the Fed. Right. Uh, the money, the money trough has become the new religion in, in capitalist society in America. And if you're the Fed is putting out easy policy, the market likes you. If the Fed's tightening policy, the market doesn't like you. And so the Fed is under tremendous political and capital pressure to do certain things. Well, we've got so much to cover <laughs> with so much going on in the world, Rob. Uh, one of the things I first wanted to, to start with was something you touched on in a video last week about how silver price, oh, I'm sorry, how spot price is determined. And I was wondering if you could tell our, our coin op viewers uh maybe a little bit about that presentation and 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 what you came up with on how uh spot price is determined for gold and silver yeah so this is the biggest educational piece in the industry i think especially for new stackers i mean if you've been in the industry for a while you probably have figured this out the biggest frustration point for people when they're investing gold and silver is why is the price not doing what it should be doing for example gold has been the biggest inflation hedge in history uh, it's money, according to our constitution. The central banks are buying it hand over fist. They're recapitalizing the central banking system with gold as a high quality liquid asset. This goes back to, you know, Basel and, and those regulatory authorities. So gold is has always been for 5,000 years and I think will continue to be at least, you know, for our lifetimes, a very important part of the financial system. And when we see what's going on in the world today, we see the wars, we see the economic issues. We see the currency problems with the not only the dollar, but the yuan and around the world. Why isn't gold doing better? Well, because the gold price is not determined by the trade that you do at your, your local coin shop. It's not determined even by the amount of gold coming out of, the, out of the mining sector. It's not just a pure supply demand equation. Gold price is determined by betters on the market betting what gold's going to be in the next three months, next two to three months. And to simplify this, gold used to be money in the United States up until 1971 when President Nixon was forced to take us off the gold standard. And he was forced because we printed too many dollars and the French and other European nations were calling us on it and trading our dollars for gold because they were redeemable back then. We had something like 27,000 tons of gold. They liquidated 19,000 tons of it. Now we have 8,000, supposedly, and been an audit in 60 years, but supposedly we have 8,000. We had to do it because if they liquidate all of our gold and we're on a gold standard, the dollar would have crashed right then and there. So Nixon did what he had to do. Um, and then in 1974, we had the Commodity Act and it created the markets that we see today. And those markets are run by the CME Group. They're in the Northeast and that's how it's traded. Ostensibly, when I got my Series 3 license and I was working at a Forex uh, dealer and learning about Forex and commodities, they'll teach you for the test that you're going to take to get licensed that the reason that the derivative market exists is for hedging it's like the miners are putting out metal they need to hedge their price exposure you know between the time that they plan their mine and the time that, that it comes out which makes sense the same thing that farmers do with wheat same thing that oil producers do with oil you have downside price risk you want to hedge but the vast majority of the trade is not legitimate hedging about 90 something percent on a given day uh, sometimes 80 to 90 percent is just speculative. So it's basically become a casino. And what happens is it's dominated by four big banks. This is confirmed not only from the CFTC, which is the regulator and their commitment to traders report, which comes out usually every Friday, about once a week. It's also confirmed by the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which puts out a report every year, actually every month, but the big one every year on the derivative positioning. And a couple of years ago, they started breaking out gold and silver and commodities. And because gold used to be classified under Forex, under the dollar, it's not the dollar. Long story short, we know it's Citigroup, JP Morgan, Bank of America, and HSBC that dominate that market. And it's right there in the government report, it's irrefutable. You put the two reports together and you know who's doing it. Now, are they doing it for clients that are coming in? Could it be sovereigns in there betting on the price? Like is China doing it? you know, or is it the banks for themselves? That type of information is not readily available. You can kind of get an idea, you know, based on some of the, the additional documents that you can find on the market, but it's purposely opaque. And I say purposely because um, I actually interviewed the guy that worked for the CFTC and he was in charge of doing, he, he was in charge of doing the investigations into uh, trading that fell outside of the rules. 
it's not really legal, but it's anything that doesn't fall inside the rules. It could be spoofing, which JP Morgan's, you know, been fined almost a billion dollars for already and manipulating that market. And it could be other things. It could be putting in trades to try to move the price. So I interviewed him at Silver Symposium a couple of years ago. Yeah, I didn't even know I was interviewing him. I was supposed to be doing a mining panel and interviewing mining execs. I'm sitting there. He walks in the room. Mining execs don't show up. They had changed it and not told me. And I suppose they did that because I knew I was the only guy being a former auditor. I was the only guy that was going to ask the real questions. So I sat down and asked him real questions. I said, what's the chances that you can monitor this market and make sure that all the trading is legitimate? And he said, well, Rob, I've been doing this for a long time. He had been retired for two years at that point, but he ran the program. So he knew the current state of the program. And he had come up through the commodity sector. He'd been a gold guy for like 40 something years before he retired. He knew the market inside and out. He had been a trader. Um, he had done the, he had dealt with physical. I think he'd been a broker at some point, wholesale broker. The guy knew his stuff. And he said, Rob, we, the CFTC monitors not only gold and silver, but a thousand different exchange traded products. We're talking commodities, wheat, every commodity you can think of, you know, even like Forex trades as well. He said, we have a thousand of those. I would need something like 20,000 people to monitor this market. I've got 12. And I said, okay, well, I guess you can't monitor that market, can you? And he wasn't going to admit it, but he said, well, you can kind of extrapolate what we can do. Now they had built a big data engine and they were using analytics and AI and stuff, but it wasn't advanced enough to where the system could figure it out. They still had the people and they just couldn't do it. And he also said, we're separate from the enforcement division. So if they found something, they sent it to enforcement and it went to a black hole. They never knew what happened. So you can imagine that a lot of these trades can go down that may or may not be on the up and up. In fact, I would say a lot of them aren't. So essentially there is the environment that permits and enables manipulation or at least enables banks and other large entities, which we know are dominating the market, particularly the short end because it's on the reports, allow them to move that around. So long story short, that's a really complicated way of saying that if you go to your coin shop, don't blame your coin dealer for the price. They have jack squat to do with it. In fact, being a coin dealer for the last eight or nine months and also having helped other reputable national dealers sell for several years, I was helping JM Bullion, which is based down here in Dallas. I wrote their blogs for a year and, and taught them how to do social media because they had never done it before. And I was helping them. Um, so I'm, I'm quite familiar with the industry. and you know, people get mad when the price doesn't do what you want. And they blame the coin dealer. We're trying to scam people or the wholesalers. And it's like, no, all of this pricing is determined outside the physical market. It has nothing to do with the physical market. It has to do with this paper trading and the paper traders don't care about shortages or supply and demand anomalies until it hits them smack in the face. What they're trying to do is make four cents on a hundred thousand ounces of gold on all these contracts so that they can scalp. They're scalping. It's just like Wall Street, where you're scalping stocks, you're day trading stocks. It's what they're day trading gold and silver, but they're also day trading oil and sugar. A few years ago, when oil went up to $140, uh, what was it, 140 bucks a barrel, uh, the oil producer were saying, well, it doesn't cost us $140. It's speculation. Nobody believed them. But in 2020, when the, the shutdowns occurred, oil went negative. It was actually negative on a contract because there was so much supply and the economies that shut down. They didn't need a positive price. They want a negative one to shut production down. So, so why didn't they accurately price in those, those shutdowns? And why didn't they accurately price in the short-term issues we had before that? Because they don't care. They just, they don't care. They're not there to price it according to supply and demand. They don't care. It's about how much money can I make in the next two to three months? And if we happen to have an issue, okay, you will adjust our trading. Uh, and that's why the markets, go where you don't think they should go until you have a supply shock or a demand shock. And then all of a sudden you have this big move, you know, and what happened in 2020 when the government shutdowns came, gold and silver just went, you know, but it took a while for that to happen. It took reality to set in until the traders finally said, okay, we need to take account that the economy shut down. We're having these issues. There's risk in the system. So again, really long answer, but it just goes to show that, you know, don't get mad at JM Bullion. Don't get mad at your local coin dealer. Don't get mad at the miners when the prices don't do what you think they should do because they don't control it. They have zero control whatsoever. It's all the speculative gamblers, the 
the adrenaline addicted gamblers that trade all this stuff, you know, up there on the exchanges. And, and Rob, that makes it. no historically, but you think today in our modern times with people being a, a, a better educated on mass today than ever before, arguably, um, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to think our quality of life is, is, you know, high enough in the West at least, uh, et cetera, that we may be insulated from like an all out civil war, you know, like we've seen in Spain, like we've seen in France, like we've seen in other places. Well, that's a tough one because the civil war would be different. It's not like we're aligned geographically. We're more aligned ideologically. So the civil war would be weird because you would have people squaring off in the same cities against each other theoretically if that were to happen. Um, and what's also different is the internet. And you, you mentioned, you know, access to information. The internet is much like the Renaissance, what eventually led to the French Revolution, was the printing press. The printing press, a bunch of books get printed, let's teach you the real history. And people started to learn to read. And they're like, wait a minute, it's not what the, you know, our royals told us, isn't this is not exactly. So they figured things out. And I think the internet is the second version of that, but it's actually much faster. I think the the revolutions that occurred because of the printing press took hundreds of years. Uh, the internet's really been going for 30 to 40. So yes, the timelines have shrunk for sure. And people's ability to almost instantaneously interact on social media, to instantaneously send information across one of these that, that and across the entire world. So, you know, anytime a country tries to prevent people, tries to, yeah, I laugh every time a government says, well, we really need to lock down that internet because, you know, we don't like all the voices coming up. You can't in today's society. You can't. How are you going to do that? Because if you do, you shut down business. If you shut down the internet, you shut down business. They, they can't. And they can try to legislate speech. But the problem is when you have this and you have encryption, eh, it ain't going to work. So, so things are going faster. And yes, I do, I do think we have the ability to prevent civil war, but it depends on these types of things. This podcast, YouTube, social media, all of us getting involved in having these conversations is what's going to stop a civil war. Because at the end of the day, civil war doesn't benefit us, the people. It benefits special interests. So we don't want to go there. And I think that we have the opportunity to prevent something like that, but it's up to us. We need to take control. It's we, the people, and we, the people, need to take control and say, we're captaining this ship. You guys had your chance. You screwed it up. Let's go back to rule by the people, representative, I would say republic, not even democracy, because democracy is mob rule, technically, but representative republic and go back to more local and state, you know, and focus on our local communities and get out of trying to police the world and get out of trying to print a bazillion dollars for anything that you want to and, you know, take the focus on that level. If the focus stays on the national level, you could have a civil war. I mean, look at what happened to the insurrection, I use in quotes, on January 6th. How has that divided the nation? Um, when that one event has divided the nation, well, why? Why do we allow it to do that? Um, I love my neighbors. I love the people down the street. I don't want to fight with them. So it, it comes down to, are we going to stay focused locally? Are we going to support our local businesses, our local schools, our local political systems? Or are we going to turn around, pull out our guns, and fight each other? And I'm hoping that, you know, cooler heads prevail and people, you know, don't break out the guns and start fighting each other. But it's up to the people and it's up to the internet and it's up to information and it's up to us talking about this. So education by far, the number one thing that we need to do to prevent something like that from occurring. I think you're right. I sure, go ahead. Uh, welcome for one thing and we're Thank you. glad to have you. But uh, what I, I just wonder, to change the subject a little bit. What's your yeah. opinion on this new digital crap the banks are trying to get to? Uh, see, now that's that's going down the rabbit hole. We're, we're going to Alice in Wonderland territory with that one. It's a great question. Uh, so finishing up my last thought, and then I'll do that one. The, the, the pricing in gold and silver doesn't reflect reality until it has to. And that's why you see people get frustrated, and then gold goes straight up. Like when gold went to 1900 in 2011, that shocked everybody. It, it hadn't done that. And when it hit a new all-time high was a month or two ago, what, 2160, whatever it was, uh, that shocked people. And they tamped it down anyway. So going on to, to your question, the CBDCs, the central bank digital currencies, 
Um, I've been studying that and I did some videos on it. I've done, I've done videos on that. I would say this, the last four years, I've done videos on aspects of that leading up to what I call my ultimate two videos, which I just put out, Brandon, I don't know, it was like a month ago. Yep. And I did the two CBDC videos. And Amazing in that, videos. I took the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, all of their projects around creating an international digital currency system. There are 130 central banks around the world creating the system. The Fed, ours in the US, has previously said they're not doing it, but they lied because their name's all over these BIS projects. So they flat out lied to the public, at least at some point they did. I don't know if they're admitting to doing a CBDC now, but for years it's like, oh, we're not looking at that because they don't want people to look away from the dollar. Why? The dollar's a reserve currency. They cannot crash the dollar. So in long story short, yes, they're creating the new system. When the dollar goes away, they've got the new system. Problem solution, right? That's the way that the elites always work. You have a problem? Oh, hey, we just happen to have a solution for you. We've been working on it for 20 years. We just didn't tell you. So central bank digital currency system are electronic tokens distributed by central banks. It's not Bitcoin. There is no decentralization whatsoever. And there's no 21 million coin limit like there is on Bitcoin. They can increase or decrease as much as they want. And in the IMF paper, the International Monetary Fund, that was written in 2015, that preceded the creation of these things. They said they wanted to create electronic money. They wanted to get rid of cash. They wanted to get rid of the bond system. They want to get rid of our entire history of money, including physical coins. And they want to go to digital. And they said this, the IMF said this, we need to control aggregate money supply. This is Keynesian economics or modern monetary theory. They believe that they control the economy by controlling the money supply. It's never worked in history. It's not going to work now. But what they want to do with that electronic currency is two things. One, they want to control how much is out there. And if they need to reduce it, they're going to take it straight out of your bank account. This is straight from the IMF paper. If you have 10,000 electronic dollars in your account, excuse me, and they're worried about inflation, tomorrow you may have 9,000. And they're going to say, oh, sorry, bail-in. What enabled the bail-in? Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank set the legal precedents for them doing this. And when they combine it with the electronic currency, they press a button. They don't even have to tell you. I just press a button. Thong, there you go. Uh, your account's been, you know, $1,000 is deleted. And in the IMF paper, they said, well, we might have to do a 100% inflation rate at one point. They literally can take everything. And that's written into law. Now, it's unconstitutional, but somebody's got to fight it. I don't see anybody fighting at the moment because I don't think people are aware. Mm -hmm.